he um, takes care of, had some bad pain in her arm and it got worse and so they've taken her to the emergency room. So that's why Buddy's not here this morning and he and Sharon were actually going to be our, our gift of music as well. So we will uh, do without an organist unless he were to show up suddenly, but we will remember his, mo his mother's name is Alice Rogers in our prayers this morning as well. And uh, many, many denominations, actually several, don't have uh, music in church other than the natural voice, like the Christian church, for instance. They biblically don't feel it's appropriate to have uh, a musical instrument in the church, so they do without it, and, and so we can too. So we'll, we'll do our best uh, without, without an organ. So I welcome you all warmly and lovingly this morning as we come together to experience the presence of God and to be in worship, to be in praise, and an attitude of thanksgiving and rejoicing this morning. A couple of announcements to share with you. Our church is hosting the Vacation Bible School this year. That is uh, July 29th for that week. We are having a second organizational planning meeting this Tuesday at 7 o'clock here. Uh, everything is organized. All the, the jobs and duties are carefully delineated. We just need some people to help with some of those opportunities. And we'd also like to know what children might possibly be attending. So there is a sign-up sheet in the narthex for both of those things. We'll also be looking for someone uh, or some peoples to do refreshments on some of the days. So there's lots of things to do. It's, uh, much of it is very simple. It doesn't require a whole lot of energy and effort, but we do need you. So if you'd like to show up for that, we'd love, love to have you here. Um, another ap activity that's not in your bulletin, but is this Thursday at 7, is a prayer shawl meeting. And that's at Susan Miller's house, Thursday at 7. And then if you look at your, um, look at your white insert, there are other things coming. Uh, mark the ice cream social on July 28th. And uh, let's see other things there. I don't think so. But we ask that you read it through carefully so you don't miss anything that might be coming your way that you'd like to participate in. Let's, uh, let's do this. Uh, do we all know To God Be the Glory, number 55? Why don't you open up your hymnal and take a look at that. <coughs> Okay, I think I've got a note for us. Why don't you stand and we'll, uh, we'll get started. Me, 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 me. You ready? To God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin and open the life gate that we may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus forgiveness receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great are rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. O oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, 
and give him the glory, great things he has done. Beautiful. Let's join in our call to worship. We rejoice in the name of God who made all things. We worship in the Lord of wisdom. We are humbled and blessed in the presence of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be open unto you. Alleluia, alleluia. Wonderful. Please be seated. <clears throat> our unison prayer is actually taken from our hymnal. It's the couple verses of hymn number 113 but I thought they were uh, beautiful and fit in with our topic for today of God's presence in our life and how we experience and acknowledge and know that presence and what our actions might be. So let us read this unison prayer in a this hymn in a prayerful, prayerful manner. Let us pray. The heavens declare thy glory, the firmament thy power, Day unto day, the story repeats from hour to hour. Night unto night, replying, proclaims in every land, O Lord, with voice undying, the wonders of thy hand. All heaven on high rejoices to do its maker's will. Then stars with solemn voices resound thy praises still. So let my whole behavior, thoughts, words, and actions be, O Lord, my strength, my Savior, one ceaseless song to thee. And now let us continue in prayer as we come before God with the deepest concerns and wonders, joys, and mysteries of our heart. O oh Lord, we understand your presence with us as constant and unceasing. And we are grateful and give you thanks and praise for your attention to us and pray that we also will be in a covenant relationship with, with you where we pay attention to you and give you honor and respect and worship you from the bottom of our hearts. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Are you feeling bold and adventuresome? How about a acapella sing-along? You can pick some of your favorite hymns and we'll sing a verse of it. And we'll just let that be our own gift of music to ourselves today. So who would like to pick their favorite or one of their favorite hymns? Just yell it out. What, how great thou art? Do you know the number of that? Is it like 44? It's number 44. 4-4. Four, four. We actually know the first verse, don't we? O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Great. Another one. 642. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. How my best thoughts by day or by night, waking or sleeping, my presence, my light. And go ahead. 92. And then we do the other one that was. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe does seek to his craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal 693 
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Maybe one more? Five nine four, and then someone said uh, one eleven. So we'll that's in the bulletin. Even we'll go on to the five nine four. Is that what I heard? Five nine four. Okay. Hope of the world, the Christ of great compassion, speak to our fearful hearts by conflict rent. Save us, thy people, from consuming passion, who by our own false hopes and aims are spent. And now let's go to uh, 111 for what I called our <coughs> sermon hymn today. <coughs> And we'll do, uh, we'll do all three verses, um, and then we'll let the children uh, be released if they want to leave, or they can stay if they want to stay, but let this just be our, our children's time, this time of singing. This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears. All nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas. And the wonders wrought. This is my father's world. The birds that carols raise, the morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my Father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is a ruler yet. This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus, who died, shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. Very, very, very nice. Very nice. Thank you so much, everybody. I have a number of prayers to, to lift up this morning. Um, you've already mentioned uh, Buddy's mother, Alice who's in the emergency room at uh, Oak Ridge at the moment, I believe, and our prayers are, are with her. Uh, Shirley Flaw, who is uh, Diane Bailey's mother and comes to church regularly, uh, was in the hospital but is now home uh, after some tests and uh, some analysis. 
Uh, Bud Blackwell was taken to the hospital the other night and they've been running tests and have just determined um, that he needs a carotid artery surgery. So I understand he'll be undergoing that surgery uh, on at least one side, if not both, tomorrow. So our prayers, uh, prayers with, with Bud. Uh, some of you might remember the Morgan family that lived here. That was before I even came. Uh, Susan tells me that uh, she just heard that Gray Morgan uh, passed away uh, July 8th. And for those of you that know the Morgan family, you might want to uh, certainly take note of that. Uh, um, we also just heard that uh, Butch Rains, who we have been following for so long, has uh, not responded well to his final round of chemo and has gone on to hospice care. And it's been a long and courageous battle that he has fought. He and his, and his wife and entire family have, have been an inspiration as they have struggled. And so our prayers with uh, Butch and the family in this final, final phase of his, of his journey. Uh, you, as you know, of course, uh, David Brown passed away and his service was held, uh, held this last week. And uh, the prayer table is an offering of flowers and a card for David and for, or for Kathy. If you've not had an opportunity to write her a note yet, you might want to uh, sign, sign that card. And uh, some of you might know the Wallace family in the community, uh, Joe and Kathleen Wallace, who have lived here almost forever in Andersonville. And of course, Emily Fritz's wife is the granddaughter of Joe and Kathleen and the daughter of Jody, who is the son, and, sh and uh, uh, Sheila. Uh, Joe passed away this, this last week, and uh, his service was at um, uh, the Baptist Church in Andersonville yesterday. Um, what, a, what an honorable man of, of, of deep faith, like so many of you here. He was gentle and quiet and uh, lived out his life with uh, incredible integrity and sincerity. And so it was a privilege to know him and um, to be at his, his service yesterday. So these are just some of the things that I have written on my prayer sheet for today. And um, do any of you have any other prayers that you would like to lift up? Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I really, I didn't hear that. Okay, thank you. Let us then be in prayer with one another. Lord God, we pause. We pause because we need to stop, sometimes stop our thinking stop our actions, even stop our singing. We pause because we need to even stop talking and breathe in your presence. So we breathe God. You are the very breath of our life, O oh God, and the heartbeat of our souls. So we turn to you, we open ourselves to you, we fill ourselves full of your presence knowing that there are oftentimes difficulties in life. There are stressors, there are losses, there are concerns and anxieties that we must deal with on a daily basis and they, they keep changing like the weather. But also in the midst of some of those anxieties and losses, there are joys 
There are moments of deep harmony and deep beauty and truth that, that overcome us with grandeur and wonder. We are anointed with oil and our cup overflows. And we are grateful, O oh God. So Lord, be with those whose names we have lifted up here this morning. There are many. And for our, the unspoken prayers in our hearts and the concerns of our mind, may they be lifted up as well. For turmoil on our earth, for conflicts between peoples of faith, peoples of ethnicity, peoples of ideologies, for these conflicts we ask that your balm of Gilead be passed over us all so we might be soothed and we might know of your peace and learn tolerance and understanding for one another. Be with those, O oh God, who have great and deep need, whatever it might be. Hold their hand, sing to them a melody of faith and of love. May we all learn how to walk through the valley of the shadow with you as our comfort, our rod, and our staff. <clears throat> in your spirit, and in Jesus' name we pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Break me, melt me, mold me, fill me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. A moment of truth, truth or dare. How many of you have read the book of Job, all 42 chapters of it through from beginning to end? More than once, more than twice. <laughs> How many of you understand the book of Job, all 42 chapters of it from beginning to end? One of my uh, professors in, in seminary, uh, Richard Henshaw, who's a brilliant Hebrew scholar and read the Bible in Hebrew, and that's why we taught from it. And he was actually the one that translated Psalm 150, that is in the Bible that most of you use. Uh, he would say that um, you, you really shouldn't even talk about the book of Job with any kind of understanding unless you have done a post-doctorate in it. And even then, it's circumspect that you know what you're talking about. So with, uh, with that kind of warning, I plan to share some thoughts about the book of Job this morning. When you think about this book and think about Job, what is it that comes to mind? Suffering, did I hear someone say suffering? The suffering of Job, the trials of Job, and it's part of our modern culture, our terminology in, in the world that you might hear or that people might use even People that don't know that the book of Job is in the Bible might even use that term because it is part of our, part of our culture. And that is how we oftentimes think of Job and then Job's faith. But today I'm going to share just a little bit of a different slant. We're not going to talk about Job's suffering, uh, but we are going to talk about the presence of God in Job's life. We're going to talk a little bit about Job's perception of God and who was God for Job. Because the situation in this story is such that, you know, Job is a good guy. He is a good man. He worships, he prays, he gives thanks, he gives God the credit. 
seems like he does all the right things in this story, which is uh, not a factual story, by the way. It falls in the, in the ideas of, of, a, of a parable, if you will, in order to try to explore some theological concepts. So Job's situation in this parable is that he is a good man. So we need to look at it in some way and make it our story. So I'm going to ask that that be the first thing that we do, is that as we think about Job, don't just think about Job, that guy over there, out there that we're talking about, but think about yourself and put your own self in the place of Job. Because Job's belief system, his whole world view, is being challenged in this story. And so the question is, is what is Job's worldview? And even more appropriate and, and, and um, meaningful is what is your worldview? What is my worldview? This story, in other words, confronts us with God confronts us with God in the living of our lives. It asks us, what do we think about God anyhow? What do we believe about God? And what do we do with this concept of God in a way, in a manner that has some relevance in our life? And how we understand that concept will affect our daily life. Our perception, our theology, our philosophy, if you will, about God makes a difference in how we might even live our life. Determined, of course, by genetics and chemistry and nature and nurture and all sorts of things that are part of our, part of our makeup. So, for example, if you believe that God is a, a demanding, a judgmental, unrelenting, punishing kind of God, kind of individual in your life, then that might translate to the way that you live out your life in relationship to other people. Or if you believe the exact opposite of that, that God is a compassionate, loving, caring God who has suffered for you and who asks you to suffer along with that God, then that might translate to your worldview, how you live your life, how you understand yourself in relationship with other people. So let's take a look at some of the stories in Job. And I've got a, a bunch of scriptures here picked out from chapter 10, chapter 12, chapter 38, chapter 40, chapter 42, and these are Job's attempt, or more importantly, the, the writer's attempt of this book of Job, to try to explore with us who is God anyhow, and where do you stand in relationship to that God. And it does have everything in the world to do with our world view. From Job 10. Job is speaking and he's actually answering one of his friends who has been talking to him, but his conversation is towards God. And he says, your hands fashioned and made me, and now you turn and destroy me? Oh, remember that you fashioned me like clay, and will you turn me to dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? Oh, you clothed me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinews. You have granted me life and steadfast love and your care has preserved my spirit. It's pretty obvious what Job's worldview there is, is it not? He is made by God. This is the creator God who has created Job in the world and not only created him originally and initially, but still 
has the power to do with Job as God wills, to turn him back to dust. So this is a God, in Job's view, who is active in his life even now. Now, there are many, 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 many views on the nature of God. And many brilliant people have written books. Paul Tillich has Systematic Theology, Volume 1, Volume 2, Volume 3. Anyone here have that next to your bed for nighttime? reading. Reinhold Niebuhr, The Nature and Destiny of Man. This is volume two. I think there's about five or six volumes. Matthew Fox, The Coming of the Cosmic Christ. Madeline, Madeline Lengel. Anyone have met any, read any of Madeline Lengel's books? Sure you have. The author of children's stories and good stuff. She weighs in with And It Was Good, Reflections on Beginnings, a tremendous theological work. Carl Jung, Young in Christianity, a Kierkegaard anthology. Anyone read Kierkegaard, that great philosopher, theologian, a Kierkegaard theology? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the famous German theologian who was put into prison by the Nazis for conspiring to have Hitler assassinated. All of these people have weighed in on the nature of God. And if you go to any library of theology. You will find hundreds and thousands of books and different ideas on the nature of God. One that was prevalent for many, many years and would have been lifted up is, is the God who is a clockmaker. Do you know that understanding of God? It basically says that God started it all like a clockmaker, put all the parts together, tinkered with it, oiled it, got it working, set it in motion, and stepped back and said, well, I got it going. It's now up to you. That's based largely upon the concept of free will. That's a worldview that says God is responsible for getting us going but not taking part in my life right now. That's not what Job believes. He says, you can turn me to dust again. So Job has a belief that God might be the clockmaker, but God the clockmaker is still tinkering with the clock, still fine-tuning, still adjusting, still involved with that clock, still making things happen, still inserts God's will into the workings of creation. Our worldview is shaped oftentimes by what we think and believe about God and how we understand God's activity in our lives, the presence of God in our very lives. Job chapter 12, and this was a couple of verses of scripture that were used at David Brown's memorial service that are very beautiful. But ask the animals and they will teach you, the birds of the air, and they will tell you. Ask the plants of the earth, and they will teach you, and the fish of the sea will declare to you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of every human being. Does not the year test words as a palate Taste food? Is wisdom with the aged and understanding in length of days? With God are wisdom and strength. He has counsel and understanding. One of the, one of the world views that many people adhere to is that it's all about physics and chemistry and biology that things just have come together in a combination of ways over 13 and a half billion years. And that combination of ways is what has brought us to our present state of existence. And that same combination of physics and chemistry and biology and science will continue 
and move us into a very distant future where things change, evolve, and end. Many people don't see God's hand in that, even as the beginner of the clockmaker, as the, as the uh, fashioner of the Big Bang, if you will. They see God as not part of this world, never was, never will be. That is a worldview that is adhered to by many people. Their theology and their philosophy of life does not include a God. But in this text from Job, even the animals and the plants and the fish are part of God's creation and part of God's teaching. Isn't that a wonderful thing? I know that many of you have said to me over the years that one of your sanctuaries, your cathedral, your churches is out in nature, out on a river, out on the lake, in the woods, in the garden. Somewhere you find God speaking to you through the beauties of the earth, through the natural environment. And you learn about God and God in your life through the beauty of the world that you have encountered. And you learn that just as God causes plants to grow, just as God is part of the seasonal changes of animals, the migrating of birds, the hibernating of bears, the salmon swimming upstream, so God is in charge of your spirit. It is a God of love who loves all of creation with a deep and abiding and an abundant love and loves you exactly the same way. And your spirit, your very life, is in God's hands. And we learn and we understand through the teaching of creation. And we begin to understand that wisdom, however, is not out there. It's something that we gain through the very grace of God. One of the things that was said at Joe Wallace's funeral was that he was the man he was because of his understanding that Christ lived in him. That he was merely a vessel that held Christ inside. And that everything he did was a vehicle for expressing his understanding of Christ's unconditional love. I think that Job would resonate with that understanding as well. In chapter 38, the Lord speaks. The Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man, Job. I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were you? when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Oh, Job, surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Perhaps one of Job's lessons that he needed to understand was that of humility. Perhaps Job thought he understood and and had it down, that he got it, that he was one of the few that really understood and he could write the definitive anthology on the nature of God. And what he's reminded of is that, you know, Job, You might look up and see and think you understand the nature of the world. You you might think that you and others understand the sky and the earth and everything that is. But not only do you not understand it, but you weren't there. You have this small sliver of history that you are privy to, and it is tiny, Job. It doesn't stretch very far 
Even the people that came before you with their knowledge leading up to you, it's not much to go on. And of course, what science has since uncovered is that the understanding of creation that was held by the ancient people was 100% wrong. They didn't have it right. And I suspect that even us now, with all our understanding, will continue to discover that, oh, by golly, we got a lot of things wrong. It is hard to know what it was like in the beginning. So just as Job is put on trial with this challenging question and his arrogance and his pride is being judged, so are we being put on trial. It's a worldview that, that might say, well, yes, there's physics and there's chemistry and there's biology and there's the cosmic understanding, but somehow in that mix, God is present, was, has been, and will continue to be present. Another worldview and another essay in another book in the theological library of time. What do you believe? What do you believe about God's presence in your life? Let us be clear that we can have to be careful not to shrink God down to our understanding. Whatever kind of box we carry God around in, we need to open up the sides of that box and release God from our meager view. For we have truly just a sliver of time and space and wisdom in which to understand the complex nature of God. Job answers the Lord. I know that you can do all things. That in itself is a worldview, a theology, is it not? It's not just a statement of faith. It is a statement of this is what I believe about you, oh God. You can do all things. And perhaps Job is admitting that he has wronged God. He has limited the nature of God in some way that he should not have. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. I don't know what your belief is, but Job's view right now is that God has a purpose. He has a plan. Does God have a plan? What kind of plan is it? Is it working? Do we have to take the really long view of this plan? Or can it include me in my short little lifetime? What is the plan that God has? Is it cosmic or is it highly individual and personal? One of the things that happened in an understanding of Jesus of Nazareth who became known as the Christ is that God's plan became highly, highly personal and individualistic. It, it didn't lose sight of the larger plan, but on a very personal level, God became present and was part of every woman's and every man's world. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. One is humbled when one is brought into right relationship with God. It's a theology of life that acknowledges that God is there, but we don't understand what's going on, not really. That we can do our part as best we can if we think God is asking us and is our vision and is inside of us, then we, we can try to connect to that and to be what God would have us to be, to strive for the highest and the very best. 
but we can't fully know what God's will and purpose might be for us, Job says. Job is humbled by this thought because he thought he knew. I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. I had heard of you, O oh Lord, by the hearing of the year, but now my eye sees you. I had heard of you by the hearing of the year, and now my eye sees you. This has to do with not just a visual scene, but this word that is used for eye also is the same word that is typically translated as a fountain that wells up from underneath, a spring that comes up like a fountain. And so it is as if like this fountain of living water in Job is now coming up and that inner self is being filled with new wisdom and new understanding that comes from God and not just from things that Job had heard others say. It has to do with that deep meditative spirit. And when Jesus says to the woman at the well, if you drink of this cup, you will never be thirsty again, he is speaking of that deep wisdom and that deep faith which wells up inside, which is nurtured and nourished by the living waters of Christ himself. What, a, what an understanding that Job is now reaching of where this wisdom is coming from and how humbled he is. And he finally says these words, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now it, it could well be that a number of us might not really like those words. The, the understanding of kids from the day that they're born is we're now teaching them that they're likable and lovable. Iliac. And yet Job's reach a different understanding here. I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. This doesn't have to do with self-esteem or even self-worth. What Job realizes is that his self-esteem and his self-worth ultimately come through God. It is God that lives in him that causes him to be the person he is of faith and of strength, of blessing and of comfort. It is Christ that lives in the person that brings them to a new understanding of humility and of grace. By grace we are saved, says the psalmist. And he repents because he realizes that God is larger than anything he can ever conceive of. But even so, that very God is present with him every moment of his life. Can you, like Job, reach that point of humility and understanding where you know that you are a creature of great worth because the presence of God lives in you both now and forevermore? Amen. Would you stand for 122, please? <coughs> 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 God on.
nature sings thy glory, and thy works proclaim thy might. Ordered vastness in the heavens, order course of day and night. Beauty in the changing seasons, beauty in the stormy sea. All the changing moods of nature praise the changeless trinity. Clearer still we see thy hand in man who thou hast made for thee. Ruler of creation's glory, image of thy majesty. Music art the fruitful garden, all the labor of his days. Are the calling of his maker to the harvest feast of praise. But our sins have spoiled thine image, nature, conscience only serve as unceasing grim reminders of the wrath which we deserve. Yet thy grace and saving mercy in thy word of truth review. Claim the praise of all who know thee in the blood of Jesus sealed. God of glory, power, mercy, all creation praises thee. We, thy creatures, would adore thee now and through eternity. Save to magnify thy goodness, grant all strength to do thy will. With our act as with our voices, thy commandments to fulfill. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his light of his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Be at your back. May the sun shine warmly on your face. May the rain fall softly on your field. And until we meet again, till we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. Amen.